Welcome back to the Team DSAS podcast. This is Enrique Hosso, the coordinator of research, advising services, and digital media at the Team DSAS office in Austin, Texas. Today, we're really excited to have Ms. Laura Olivas, the Senior Director of Admissions at the Texas Tech Health Science Center, Paulo Foster School of Medicine in El Paso. Ms. Olivas is going to discuss all of the steps that you need to take to prepare as a junior for the Team DSAS application. Among this discussion, we're going to talk about your test prep and how you should bring your best self to your test date, how to select the best evaluators that can support your application, writing your essays, anticipating how an admissions committee is going to read them, how your involvement in extracurricular activities is going to play a big part in your application, and how to select the school that best fits you. We'll do this by discussing the curriculum at the Texas Tech Health Science Center Paulo Foster School of Medicine and the different characteristics they seek in their applicants. This will help you be a little bit more competitive by aligning your goals with the school's mission and value statements. Without any further ado, here's Ms. Olivas. Ms. Olivas, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, since this is your first time on the podcast, would you mind telling us a little bit about you and your role at the school? Sure. So I'm the senior director for the Office of Admissions here at Foster School of Medicine. Uh, I was born and raised in El Paso, and I'm happy to um, answer any questions. Awesome. Or guide you. All right. Well, we've got a lot of excellent talking points to discuss today, so we're just going to dig right in. Uh, and so for your junior year of college, as you're preparing for professional school, it's uh, it's important for you to note that if you anticipate on going to professional school, whether it's medical, dental, or veterinary school, uh, you have to apply during your junior year so that when you graduate from college, you already have that school lined up. And so I just wanted to kind of reiterate, if you're pursuing that traditional trajectory uh, on going to professional school right after graduating from college, this is the year when you apply your junior year, your third year of college. And so the, we're going to attack the elephant in the room. Uh, this is a year when you take your entrance exam, which is your MCAT, your DAT, or your GRE uh, for veterinary applicants. So, Ms. Olivas, do you have any study habits you'd like to share with students? What we usually uh, tell a student is that they need to approach studying as if they, it were their full-time job or mm -hmm. school, manage their time with their course load. We've, um, had, we've experienced that the students that dedicate the most time to studying um, usually get the best scores. Yeah, and, and that's actually something that we discussed when uh, I was working in my previous role with JAM. Uh, is that we actually did a, a longitudinal study to see where the students were doing the best. And it turned out that those students that were taking the most full-length practice tests were the ones that were doing the best. And I think that comes back to the fact that these tests are extremely long and a lot of students don't have the ability to either have the stamina to sit for a long test or who really struggle with getting questions answered in a certain amount of time. And I think uh, with taking multiple full-length practice tests and simulating that environment that you're going to go into for testing, um, it's really important and really key so that applicants can really be prepared for those tests because it's not just a, it's not just the mental game. It's also, unfortunately, the physical game of being able to sit for almost eight hours to take that test. Yes, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, can you tell us... I know that we often talk about the MCAT, the DAT, and the GRE, kind of an anticipation for some of those tests that happen later once you're in medical school. Can you give us a quick glimpse into uh, kind of what a second year's schedule might look like so that we can put that in comparison to what a junior's schedule might look like? Our curriculum is a little bit different than other curriculum. So mm -hmm. at the same time that you're going through your courses, you're also doing uh, your clinical skills at the same time, um, going through, um, you know, cases, uh, having interactions with standardized patients. So you're pretty busy the whole time. And uh, so then you, in between all that, you really have to dedicate time to study for the STEP um, so it will be, you know, preparing yourself for the MCAT, taking those habits and bringing them to your, and when it's time for your step, 
and into your medical school studies will help you a lot. It would really prepare you um, to get to know your study habits and uh, learn a lot about time management so that you can dedicate you know, the, the most time um, with um, studying for your med- medical school and for your test, your step scores and all that. <laughs> yeah, so that, that junior year is pretty much just like a test run for what your medical school is going to be like. So. We get a lot of students who kind of complain that there's too much jammed into that year, but it's just a small glimpse into what that medical school career is going to look like. Definitely. Yeah. Moving on to the next point, we want to talk about evaluators and approaching evaluators and getting those letters of evaluation. Uh, Do you have any advice, perhaps kind of reverse engineering what a medical school is expecting out of a letter so that a student can be better prepared on who to ask for a letter? So on on the letters, uh, we are looking to see from professors, supervisors, um, anybody that you've developed relationships with that can talk to us or tell us about the person or the student as a student and as a person, your personal characteristics, um, time management skills, study habits, um, you know, if you're a um, service-oriented person. Mm -hmm. Pretty much anything that can be discussed in the, that isn't already discussed in the application. Right. Yeah, kind of giving it that additional... um, dimension yeah somebody is that's going to be your champion yeah oh, why I you would that. be a good um um physician mm-hmm. in the future mm-hmm. amazing i love that <laughs> uh and so i wanted to share that in the description of this episode we're linking the aamc's guidelines for writing a letter of evaluation for a medical school applicant and i'm getting back on my soapbox to talk about the core competencies as you're finding your champion, as Ms. Olivas mentioned so eloquently, uh, you really want to make sure that the person who is writing your evaluation is aware of what's going into your entire application and kind of sets apart certain skill sets, certain strengths or competencies that they can highlight uh, to either supplement or support your application. And so please visit that, uh, that link that we have on here to look at that brochure and perhaps even print it out and bring it to your evaluator when you ask for a letter so that they have that information on what the medical schools are looking for. And even for those of you who are dental or veterinary applicants, the core competencies are not necessarily defined in those two quite yet. Uh, Dentistry has competencies uh, that are lined out and they're very similar to the medical school uh, competencies and veterinary schools have actually laid out all of the competencies that you're expected to have as a veterinarian and you'll see a lot of overlap. So you can actually use this guide as well to uh, guide your evaluator to help write a better letter of evaluation. So moving on to the other big element of the application is those personal statements or the narratives. Coming from a medical school, what is it that the schools are looking at in those and how can a student better prepare in the application as a junior? Well, we're looking to see um, what your motivation um, for becoming a physician is, Mm -hmm. um, what your influences are or were, um, your experiences, your life experiences, um, healthcare experiences, community and volunteering experiences experiences that you've had that have made you, you know, or motivated you to become a physician. Those those are very important. This is the time to highlight that. Uh, Do you have any advice? One of the, one of the big questions that we've gotten from, uh, from our online communities is about that second essay, which is asking about what aspects you bring to enhance the diversity of the school. Do you have any advice on how, Uh, your school specifically might look at that question and uh, kind of weigh that in an application? Well, we're we're looking um, for a diversified um, student population. So, you know, this is where you're going to express yourself as to why, um, what, what of your experiences, um, your background, anything that would bring that diversity into our medical school. Mm -hmm. And it can be on anything, you know, not just, you know, ethnicity and, and um, but it can be anything, anything, your experiences. 
Mm -hmm. uh, your background um, that would bring a diverse population to our student body. Right. And I think that's something that's really important is that, you know, everybody has something. This essay isn't asking if you're a minority uh, or if you're underrepresented, Definitely. You come from a background that's underrepresented in medicine. But this, what this is asking is what makes you, you. Unique. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. And so, I mean, you could be somebody who's in rural Texas where your high school class was five students, mm -hmm. uh, or you could be somebody in like urban middle of the city, Houston, you, those are two completely different experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, or you might be somebody who grew up on the border in the valley or somebody who uh, is from Irving in between Dallas and Fort Worth. Those are all completely different experiences and it exposes you to different aspects of how to tackle problem-based questions, for example, right. in a medical school setting. You know, you have those four people in a, in a class uh, tackling the same the same issue, they're all going to come at the come at it from different perspectives, and I think that's one something that uh, the curriculum at Paulo Foster really helps highlight. Would you agree? Yes, yes. So definitely, even if you come from a big city, you know the a life experience that you might have had, mm -hmm. you know anything. We all deal differently with experiences that we have in our life, and so that you know that would definitely be something that you might want to you know talk about as to why it affected you, the way it affected you, and it would bring into the diversity of the population. Yeah, we also want to continue to encourage you to explore grow in your clubs and organizations, any extracurriculars that you're involved in. Uh, obviously, during the application, we ask which activities you've been involved in and uh, kind of anticipate um, which activities you have planned beyond the application. Uh, do you have any insights on that, Ms. Olivas? Well, yes. I mean, just continue again. I mean, if, and if you have leadership roles in these clubs, organization is most definitely continue uh, with those. Um, it, you know, it shows um, your leadership skills, um, you know, in the future and as a student right now would, would show very well. Um, we're looking for those students also that are able to take on those roles. Yeah. And, and not necessarily to take on multiple roles, but really focus on mm -hmm. the roles that are important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How many times do you come across an application where you can clearly tell that they joined like the pre-health society uh, just to have something on their resume? Yes, yeah. definitely. We can, <laughs> we can tell. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yes. All right. Well, I think the big section that we really wanted to address in this episode is that as a junior, this is your time to do the research into which schools you want to go into. Um, do you have any resources on where students can start kind of st start doing this research and what to look out for? Well, they can definitely, um, l you know, go to the, la you mentioned the AAMC, they can definitely go to the AAMC and research, you know, all the medical schools that are around the country uh, and then take a look at their websites and mm -hmm. see what their mission uh, statement is, uh, the curriculum that they offer, um, you know, what, how competitive is it? Um, the cost, especially for Texans, I know that yeah. here in Texas, medical school is is uh, definitely a lot cheaper. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you have to look for a school um, that you will that will be a good fit for you. Um, That's definitely a good point. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to highlight your school a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, for example, Our, how the what the curriculum is like? Yeah, so our curriculum um, is not a traditional curriculum. It's, it's uh, more of a system-based curriculum. Uh, we do have a pass-fill curriculum also. Um, so and with that said, what, what happens here is that you're taught, you're not, in traditional schools usually teach you, you know, your anatomy, biochemistry, physiology, and all that stuff. During the first two years here, it's a, a clinically based. So you're learning all these um, courses 
uh, throughout your first two years, but you're all based on clinical presentations. So um, you're um, studying about the anatomy uh, of the throat, for example, mm -hmm. but you're also learning the biochemistry, the pharmacology of it, um, and then you have those clinical um, interactions with uh, standardized patients, and you get to diagnose uh, and develop your diagnosing uh, reasoning skills with these encounters that you have on a weekly basis mm -hmm. with these standardized patients. And that's significantly mm -hmm. different. It's really the onus is on the applicant to anticipate and start picking out what they like, what aspects they like about different schools. The other thing you should also look in, in regards to school, I mean, how, how many students they have. I mean, do you learn better in a small school setting mm -hmm. or, you know, with, uh, with um, you know, 200 plus students? Yeah. We, for example, we only take in 100 students, so it's a pretty small school. You get to know everybody. And as well as learn from each other, we like to promote that a lot where uh, since it's a pass-fail system, mm -hmm. uh, the students get to learn from each other, not only just the professors. And so uh, the professors here, are dedic they dedicate 80% of their time to teach the students and are available when you come knocking on that, their door for help. Wow. Now, I kind of want to dig into this um, as, as a fellow native El Paso and uh, what role does the region play in the medical education? Well, we have a lot of underserved uh, people here. So that's definitely one of the things that the medical school is trying to address here in El Paso. Mm -hmm. And so we also have, uh, and part of that is that we have four, um, four uh, underserved area clinics that the students um, here get to volunteer as early as the first day here in, in our medical school. Uh, they get to sign up, they get to experience real patients. Um, and they don't do it just alone. You know, you go in there to a room and, and try to diagnose this patient, do the workup and all that. You have a second year or a third year with you to get you uh, going um, or, you know, experience it. You come, ba you come back out and you uh, present to an attendee. So at the same time, you're also learning and experiencing, um, you know, the presentation to the attendee. And so when you're in your third and fourth year, you already experienced all of this and you're pretty much, you know, um, an expert already, if you yeah. want to say it, uh, if you will. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we try to address the language barrier. Uh, we do have a lot of um, patients that only speak Spanish. So part of our curriculum is for students to learn um, basic Spanish, medical Spanish, so that they're able to communicate with um, these um, patients. And because, you know, sometimes uh, things get lost in translation. Yeah. So looking at it from the applicant's perspective, if I'm really interested and in connect with the mission at Foster School of Medicine, perhaps something that I might want to do to kind of prepare for that is to maybe start taking some of those introductory Spanish courses so that by the time I get to that school, I'm already ready to start tackling, you know, medical terminology in Spanish. Yes, that's definitely an option, but we do like to point out that you do not have to know um, Spanish, um, you know, to get accepted into our med uh, medical school. Awesome. Um, it's not a requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, but, it, it, but you know, most definitely, if you want to do it, great. That's a plus on your um, on your application. Uh, but, you know, when you get here, you are um, evaluated. Yeah. And then your your uh, classes begin at the level that you're at when you're evaluated. Okay. Well, we've come to the end of our list. Again, thank you so much for joining us today, Ms. Olivas. We really appreciate your insights and all of the excellent information that you've shared, not just for uh, for our junior applicants, but also about the Foster School of Medicine. Thank you for the invitation. As we heard from Ms. Olivas, the tests are very important for your application. These will include the MCAT, the DAT, or the GRE, depending on what kind of school you're applying to. Also, a lot of schools are starting to implement the CASPER assessment, which is an assessment that tests how well you're able to react to different situations. 
If you want more information about Casper or any of the other entrance exams, make sure to check out our website, tmdsas.com, and uh, visit the admissions test section. Another important point in this episode was about selecting your evaluators. We mentioned how important it is to select your evaluators that are going to best align with what aspects you're trying to highlight in your application. A fantastic resource for you is going to be the AAMC's Guidelines for Writing Letters of Evaluation, which is linked in the description of this episode. This is a great resource you can share with your evaluators so that they can see all of the core competencies that the schools have defined, which will help them write a more robust letter that really addresses what an admissions committee is looking for. We also discussed how extracurricular activities come into play with your application. Starting in EY 2020, the TMDSAS application allows you to select your three most meaningful activities, which means that you have the opportunity to really highlight these activities in a 500 character essay per activity. Choose these carefully because they're gonna play a big part in how an admissions committee member is going to read your application. Finally, we talk a little bit more about the Paulo Foster School of Medicine and how its mission and value statements come into play in the admissions committee In two previous episodes of the podcast, episode 34, Planning Your Next Steps, Preparing Your Marketing Campaign, and episode 35, Leveraging the Core Competencies in Your Favor, go deep into how these schools have defined these core competencies and how they expect applicants to highlight these competencies in their application and really show that you are the best match for that school. On behalf of everyone here at TMDSAS, we'd like to wish all of our current applicants all the best of luck in this application cycle. If you have any other questions, make sure to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and now Instagram. And also join our online communities on Facebook, the TMDSAS Hub, and the TMDSAS Non-Traditional Applicants Groups, where we continue the conversation that we start here in the podcast and address all of the questions that you have about the application cycle. That's it for this episode. We'll talk to you later.